Hey guys, and welcome to episode 198 of the OCDStories.com podcast. Now, in this episode, I chat with Laurie Johnson, who is a therapist based in Denver, who specializes in OCD, anxiety, and addiction. And you may be familiar with her because I've got her on the show before. Uh, And I wanted to get her back on, in particular, to talk about families, um, supporting families, and how families can support their loved ones of OCD. In this particular episode, uh, we talk about boundaries, uh, loving boundaries in particular, and how boundaries can help the family um, help themselves, but help, you know, if they if they look after themselves, they can better help those people with OCD. Um, we talk about preventing burnout when helping a loved one with OCD. We talk about authentically praising people with OCD. Then we talk about what to do when someone is asked for reassurance, what to do when someone is compulsively confessing something. Um, how, what to do if you catch someone in the act of doing a compulsion and if you should do anything. Uh, Lorraine talks about, uh, I ask her a question about meaningful life, which I haven't asked for a while on the podcast. Um, and because Laurie specializes in addiction as well as OCD, we also talk about boundaries, self-care and helping someone who is affected by both addiction and OCD. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's an important episode. I hope if you have OCD, it can help you um, work with your family in different ways. Um, if you have a loved one with OCD, I hope it gives you some ideas on how better to help them and also, you know, look after yourself too. So without further ado, here is Laurie. On the podcast today, I have Laurie Johnson. Laurie is a therapist based in the Denver area who specializes in OCD, anxiety, and addiction. Laurie runs a private practice called In Focus Counseling. Welcome back to the show, Laurie. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. It's good to have glad you to here. Be talk- yeah, glad to be talking about families and um, just how we can support. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I mean, the first episode we did, for anyone that hasn't listened, I, I, I recommend go check it out. And that was about OCD and addiction together, um, which is kind of your niche or specialty. Um, and But today, as you, you mentioned there, we're going to be talking about families and how families can support uh, their loved ones of OCD, but also how they can support themselves from burnout, I guess. Um, so, yeah, but before that, kind of just a general catch up, kind of what's new with you? What's new with me? Yeah, you can answer yeah. that any way you want. Yeah, okay. Um, I have been over the last like two years just really expanding my um, in focus counseling into a group practice. So, having more clinicians. Uh, more master's level trained clinicians in OCD so that they can provide lower cost services to the community. So we just had an open house. I told you right before we began, my office is super clean right now. (laughs) Um, But just it was a really awesome night, like kind of collaborating with our colleagues and especially uh, my addiction community, just introducing them more to the elements of OCD so that they can start working on things in their own realms. Um, another side project, I'm working with another OCD colleague on just some training things. So more to come about that in the future. Cool. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, congrats. And, uh, Life's good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's fall here. I just went leafing. What's some leafing? Some self-care. Uh, just looking at the, oh. <laughs> the leaves changing. Um, so went in, uh, up into the uh, mountains here in Colorado mm. yesterday. Went for a long drive and a long hike and just got some self-care time in. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Um, okay, cool. So, uh, talk to me about boundaries. Okay. Um, boundaries are really big and I think really hard for everyone to implement. Um, normally when we hear boundaries, we think, okay, like we're protecting ourselves and, um, you know, not letting people get through, but it's more about doing things for, yourself, not in a selfish way, but in a way that feels good or mutually beneficial to both parties. Um, A lot of the context that I'm working with boundaries is in addiction and OCD about when families are saying like, this is, this is enough. We can't do this anymore. 
if you still want help, we're willing to help you. But here's kind of our, um, here's our rules or here's how we can accommodate. How do you feel about that? And kind of getting feedback from each party. So boundaries are a way that, um, we work and support people without eventually feeling resentful, without feeling burnt out, um, without feeling angry or like we're doing more than another person is on their own, you know, the, the things they need to work through on their own, like whether that's addiction or OCD, like sometimes, uh, parents or families with OCD start to get really burnt out on like everything is around my child, my partner, everything is about OCD. And I don't like that element. Like it's okay to set a boundary that could look like talking or having family meetings about OCD. And then the rest of the time, all it is is support. Maybe there's um, code words for it. Maybe it's about asking, hey, may, may I challenge you on your ERP right now? Can I participate in your exposure with you? Do you want support? And like really giving an individual an opportunity to say yes or no. And then on the other end of that is when a person's participating in their own exposures with OCD, being able to ask a family member or a friend or whomever, do you have time to support me right now? I really need you. And here's how I need you to show up. Can you do that? And if not, when? Mm. Yeah, so almost being quite specific in your ask for help. Um, is that fair to say? Like, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. I know, I, I think when people ask you for help, it, if you, especially if you're busy or stressed, it can be quite overwhelming. But if they say, this is what I need, uh, maybe this is how long or whatever, the person is more likely because they kind of see not an end to that support, but they know what you, is being asked of them. Yeah. And that's the really big thing with boundaries too, is that the more specific you can get, which sometimes isn't possible. Sometimes, you know, a person's just so stressed out. Sometimes a family member is stressed out that they just yell or say like, you know, scream no, or, you know, someone goes into their compulsions. It's about, okay, you know, can I be as concise as possible? And if not, how do I try to do that next time? And it boundaries are about not leaving things completely open ended because anytime that happens, Mm -hmm. anyone being asked to do something feels overwhelmed because it's like, okay, well, how long do you want me to do this? How long will this exposure take? How long might you be stuck in this one obsession? How long is our family going to have to keep doing this? How long? You know, like, and those questions of uncertainty in general, like, I don't think the human mind does well with. Yeah. So then that person um, who's being asked to help um, may feel over, over committed, over obligated, and actually just say no out of fear, which people with OCD can understand that. But in that moment, when that individual is struggling. They don't care. They just see like my mom just rejected me or my partner doesn't care about what I'm going through. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, so boundaries are a lot about communication too. Okay. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. And so you do sessions with parents separately sometimes. Um, and I'm guessing you've probably done it for spouses as well for whether the husband or wife has OCD um what are some examples you i mean you've given some but like uh examples of boundaries that they've put in place for themselves um a lot of the times when i'm introducing the family system into the therapeutic rapport or the therapeutic session i'm really broaching that with people right from i'm getting on the phone with them like hey your family might be super helpful in doing this and of course we're talking about like adolescents, maybe 13, 14, all the way through adulthood. Um, sometimes little kids may have this insight as well to, you know, choose who's involved or not. But typically this is the context is from, um, adolescents or adults and introducing that element to them, like your friends, your family, your partner may be super helpful to what we're doing. 
And that doesn't mean that might be ripping off the Band-Aid for you later on. That might be saying, hey, this person is not able to participate in this compulsion with you. Mm. And the reason why is that you're not allowed to be, this is not permitting you to be mother and son or husband and wife. You are now both stuck in the OCD cycle and you're not actually tending to your relationship. Like OCD is right in the middle Mm. every time. So I think that it allows them to see, you know, yeah, my, this other person is affected by that, but I still need them. I want them in a different way. And normally after like three or four sessions, we introduce having a family member come in. Um, I always suggest a few books right off the bat, loving someone with OCD, um, I'm forgetting the title right now, but John Hirschfield's book. uh, When a Family Member Has OCD. Great book. Um, And also the daring to challenge OCD. Like, here's what we're doing. Mm. And just because you're here doesn't mean that you can call this person out all the time. There has to be some boundaries around your son, your daughter, your partner um, going through this treatment is that you can't always pull the OCD card. Right. It's kind of like the the card in soccer. What is it? The red card? Red card. Yellow card. Yeah. Red and yellow. Yeah. (laughs) It comes out all the time. Right. Oh, I hit my shin. (laughs) Oh, this, oh, that. Like you can't pull that card all the time because that Mm. allows the family system to scapegoat and target an individual, therefore not helping their treatment with the family being involved. So I'm talking about boundaries right off the bat. And I normally open that up to the individual who's coming to support us. How have you been affected by this? Hmm. What do you think would be helpful for you to get on board and support, you know, your loved one with what they're going through? You know, and most people say like, I just really want to know that they're okay. And there's a boundary there. Like we can't ever guarantee that someone's okay. Mm -hmm. We just have to do the best we can with what we have available. And I think that those two books around OCD and families really addresses that. Like you're really going to have to pull off some tough band-aids and be in pain yourself and also see your loved one in pain. And I think that's the hardest thing is like you have to pull the boundary Hmm. regardless of how much they're hurting. You can still hug them. You still love them. You still spend time with them. But the hard, yeah, the hard parts in that are just like, okay, I'm about to tell you no because you're seeking reassurance that you're a good person. And I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to answer that. Hmm. And you can still eat dinner with us. I'm still going to hug you. I still love you, but being really careful about that, not turning into a compulsion either. It's like, I always need to hear mom or my partner say that they love me. They can withhold that too. And it doesn't mean they don't love you. Hmm. It means they're there to help you. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah, really, really good point. Thanks for going into it. Um, something that sticks out for me as well is like, um, to uh i remember hearing this psychologist on this podcast talking about uh, him and his wife setting a boundary their daughter was chronically physically ill um for for many years uh to the point it was unbelievably stressful for the for the whole family there were so many doctors appointments surgeries you name it medications and and they said for the sake of their marriage they set a boundary of after 8 p.m. we will not talk about we can talk about our daughter but we will not talk about her ailments what's causing her pain etc uh, because if they didn't set that boundary it would have just destroyed them because all they would have talked about is her and her issues which would have weakened the marriage and yeah is yeah that- it does weaken relationships and that's a great example of boundaries setting time limits um, setting amount of times, probably more in the beginning of treatment amount of times that someone's able to ask about something, um, setting aside time for family meetings to have conversations about what needs to change, Mm. um, or what needs to be added in. Sometimes it's like, all right, everybody, we need to have fun (laughs) or mom and dad need a break. Like 
there's going to be, you know, a babysitter come watch you and your siblings or, you know, you're in charge and, um, we, we need to go out. We need some separation around this so that mom and dad can kind of come back with like a fresh look on things Mm -hmm. instead of that targeted focus on a scapegoat, um, or the person who's suffering. It can also be, um, Boundaries for the individual about their parent doesn't have to know every single thing that's going on in therapy. Boundaries around attendance and therapy, like some individuation around um, some checking and that checking being on the other end of like, hey, have you done your exposure homework? Hmm. How's therapy going? Where's your anxiety level? What's your Y box score? Did you do your reading today? Like this kind of like finger wagging and it's out of anxiety for that individual to know, like, are they doing their work? But there can be a boundary on that end as well. Like, look, I only want to check in with you at our family meeting or Mm. once a week, or I will let you know when I'm ready to talk about this. And you can let me know if you're ready at that time to talk about it instead of this turning into kind of a relational component of some issue that's really about the disorder in that person needing um, some individualism or some processing on their own. So it, it goes both ways. Boundaries aren't just on the individual who's suffering. Hmm. Yeah. And boundaries. So it's both ways. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think that's great because, yeah, if, if someone's asking you constantly, like you said, those those metrics, you know, you're the Y box or SUDs or whatever it is, or have you done your homework? Um, especially if that person never really enjoyed school or doing homework, <laughs> uh, being chased by a teacher, so to speak, it might where it might feel like being chased by a teacher, which is from I mean, if I think about my childhood, that would have just pushed me away because <laughs> yeah, you get this rebel spirit, and you're like, I'm not doing my homework. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay, cool. And for the family member who doesn't have OCD, but is obviously affected by OCD. When this topic of boundaries comes up, I can imagine for some of those people, there's a lot of guilt around setting a boundary. Um, And I guess, how would you navigate that as kind of the therapist? Um, I think that is a really emotional topic that comes up for, um, you know, the, the client and their family, because it's like, if I, I've been doing this thing for so long and it's in, it's natural for us to provide reassurance to people to let them know they're going to be okay in the world. And then it's hard when you, you're first starting out treatment with ERP or even, you know, reignition, reinitiating, you throw this blanket over reassurance and you're like, you can't have that cute little warm, fuzzy thing that you used to have before. Mm. And it's like, why not? you know, my sister gets it or, um, everyone else can have this. Like, why can't I have it? And it's just because, you know, you want to, we have to kind of throw the blanket over it to see what is the normalcy in, in reassurance, like organically versus OCD reassurance, which obviously is a compulsion. So I think that becomes a really emotional topic because people feel like once they start to back away from providing that reassurance, or giving people more, more, even their partners, more individuation with what's going on with them, there's blank time and space in between. And I think it sometimes causes anxiety in that other person of like, are they okay? Hmm. I haven't heard anything. I don't see they're okay. I still see their compulsions or I still see they're depressed or they don't know. So they want to kind of keep checking in on that. Yeah. And I think just to bring even bringing up the topic, like what would it be like for you to tell your partner that you can't tell them you love them, that you're not going to answer that question right now Mm. and then roll over and go to sleep? I mean, the tears start flowing. It's like I could never imagine doing that. That that is so mean. Mm. Why would I do that? And then just continuing to kind of reinforce like this is what they're asking for. This is what they need to do to get better. Like um, explaining the paradox behind ERP treatment um, and then 
it's more experiential. Like w- once they do it, they're like, oh, I get it now. It is so, it's a different, I love you. Hmm. And having them see that is so much more important and they have to rip the bandaid off and, and do it. So I think discussing those boundaries is really emotional because it makes the supporter or the family member feel like they're doing something wrong. Yeah. Like inherently removing away all the things that make them a kind, caring, compassionate person when really it's like we got to flip it on its head and it seems like it's mean, but it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. And I like what you said there. It's, it's a, it's a different, I love you, you know, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. And sometimes I get calls like, Oh my God, that hour was so valuable of my time. I learned so much from you and I learned so much about my partner and I learned so much from them. It is a different, I love you. And like, you were right. Thanks so much. That was really hard. And like, I did it. And they're super excited because then they can like be back on board with them Mm. and just get back to like the way that things were before that started to happen or the way that, um, they had kind of anticipated or, or planned out their life or the way that it was when OCD was a little more moderate or whatever the case may be. Yeah. They kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and then they're like, okay, I'll do whatever I need to be. I realize that I might have to appear mean, but I'm really helping. Yeah. Yeah. Good and if not, I get my partner permission to tell me like, Hey, that was really mean. That's not part of the ERP. Let's back that up a little okay. bit. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Um, is, is there anything else on boundaries before we move on to some of the other questions? Um, I think what makes boundaries the most difficult is that just like with ERP, like imagine, and you know, for all the people that are listening now, if you imagine a boundary as when your family members implementing that or when you're implementing that, it's just as scary as an exposure Mm. because the ultimate fear is like, Oh my gosh, this person's not going to honor this. And there's some times in which families should not be involved in treatment is when it is more detrimental to that person for the family member to even be in the room than it is for them to get on board and help. And some that happens, Mm. but it's like, if I ask or set a boundary, someone's going to reject me. Someone's going to be mad at me. Someone may not be able to do that. Um, They might not be able to honor my request. Like, that's really scary. There's a level of assertiveness that um, may or may not be wrapped up in a person's compulsions to begin with, that that in itself is even scary to invite someone in or to ask for a boundary or to hear a boundary back. So it's complicated. I think there's a lot of assertiveness which is sometimes why a therapist can be helpful, someone who works from a family systems perspective, to introduce that concept from a psychoeducation purpose, first and foremost. And then, like, hey, this isn't just your, someone asking you to do something flippant. There's some information behind this. Hmm. Um, and then the other part is that when you're in any kind of system, whether it's friends, coworkers, families, if one thing, it's like a spider web. If one thing changes over here, the whole web moves and something gets changed somewhere. And it almost requires everyone within the system to make some sort of accommodation around that new behavior. Yeah. And sometimes other family members don't like it. Sometimes it takes some time. Um, I think sometimes people come in and say like, oh, that was really wonderful. Thank you so much for the help. And other people call back and are like, we need to come in again. (laughs) It's not working. And it's just like, that is what it takes to really change is that it's not immediate. And once you start implementing boundaries, they are really lifelong because you will implement them in other situations in which they're needed. Hmm. Whether you tell your friend you know, I, I'm not available to do that thing for you. No, I can't pick you up right now. Um, or I need a ride or, um, I can't loan you money, Mm. (laughs) whatever it is. 
Yeah. There's all kinds of boundaries. They exist everywhere, not just within OCD or addiction. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Um, yeah, it's kind of that, that Jim Carrey movie, The Yes Man, where he kind of, <laughs> is it Yes Man? Where he says yes to everything yeah. and, uh, he, you know, he needs some boundaries. Uh, yeah, it's important for our own kind of sanity and uh, self-care. So after everything we've talked about, how does, because you work with addiction as well um, and OCD and addiction combined, uh, how does everything you've kind of said change if it does for addiction? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. The concept around boundaries and helping and offering support um, and self-care and all those things that we've talked about are the same, but I think we have so much stigmatization around addiction in general that even though addiction itself or chemical dependency, whatever, you know, whatever category people fall into, um, versus OCD, a diagnosis, people really see those families really see those as very different things, right? You know, my partner, my loved one, whomever has OCD and they've just really been struggling and I'm really happy to support them and they involve me in on treatment. And, you know, the other night we had a really tough night, but we worked through it. Mm. And it's like a focus on we are tackling the disorder together. With addiction, it normally starts to be these issues of morality, like they really need to get it together. They didn't show up to this other thing. They continue to use drugs. Um, I don't even know if they're trying. Mm. When, you know, at certain points in ERP therapy, a person may be really struggling. Like they may avoid their ERP, just like a person who is um, has addiction problems or um, is struggling with quitting drinking, using whatever. It, it's like this is a, addiction is about morality versus the actual disorder. Mm. Um, I've had people even write on my social media pages like addiction is not a disorder, it's a choice. And it's like if that random comment makes it onto my page, a, a, a specialist in addiction, um, it's everywhere. And it means that there's a lot of harm being caused to treating one different than the other. Um, sometimes the impact is the same. Sometimes there's a lot of financial dumping into treatment for OCD, just as a, an, a person with addiction has dumped money into drugs or alcohol or lost money or whatever. I, it, it, the disorder, the symptoms are the same. People lose their houses. People lose their jobs. Mm. People lose their partners or get in car accidents or do things that are considered immoral at times. Everyone does that. So why is one different than the other? And I think that just goes back to a lot of context on how we've treated addiction in the past and how we see it as a moral flaw hmm. versus OCD. We're like, okay, yeah, this is a definite disorder. We can kind of see the elements of that. They're the same with addiction too, but hmm. we treat it differently. And it's like, instead of helping and saying, oh, I'm so proud of this person, um, we say, you know, they're still, they're still not there. We hope they get better. Yeah. So you, know, you should just stop drinking. Well, yeah. you should just stop your compulsions. That's not helpful. <laughs> that's true. We all know that that's, that's not an effective way to, to deal with that. Yeah. So in the case of, um, one of your clients that has OCD and an addiction, um, and let's say the family are somewhat stigmatizing towards the addiction, but accepting of the OCD and on board with helping with the OCD, but maybe they're resistant or more negative around the addiction. Is that just psychoeducation to kind of, as you just said to me around, they're pretty much, they're not the same, you know what I mean? They should be treated the same. Um, yeah, psychoeducation. And sometimes for individuals, it's like dealing with their own, um, they might have some uh, family history or family lineage around addiction. Um, there may be other reinforcers that constantly taught that person that this is bad. Maybe um, parent or partner grew up in a very religious household or never had any experience with drugs or alcohol. 
never saw it before. And then they're just in like this culture shock. So sometimes there's some other elements at play or just the anger of repetitive use. And those are things that have to be worked through. Mm -hmm. Same with OCD. It's like, if you are so mad at someone for all the, the harm you felt they did to you with their OCD, they're just as mad as you for not helping them through their struggle. So it is a lot of psychoeducation. What I like to do is um, draw or print out the cycle of addiction in the brain areas that are impacted by each. And then the cycle of OCD in the brain areas that are impacted by each of those. And they're like, oh, yeah, that is the same. Huh. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, and sometimes with addiction and OCD, the addictive behavior is actually the obsessive compulsive cycle. And then they overlay and they're like, okay, this really is about escaping the turmoil of OCD versus this, you know, person is just choosing to do this. Hmm. Choice is, I'll use choice loosely. Yeah. <laughs> but for them to be able to have that aha moment for themselves yeah. is more important than me or their family member or someone else giving them a lecture on what should be done because then they're like, Oh, I can see it. That's really interesting. I never thought about it that way. And it just shifts their world. Yeah. And again, I just want to validate that there are many family members who are not supporting and are not going to be a great support. And it's just like finding who that person mm -hmm. is. It might be a friend. It might be, you might be doing wonderful work on your own without the help of others. But it's just helpful to know that if that is your family situation, that you're not alone. And this happens all the time. Yeah, that's true. And that's where support groups can come in helpful as well. Yeah. Yeah. That peer Absolutely. support. Yeah, peer support, um, even just like lecture. When I was in Boston, they have a lot more resources than here in Denver. A lecture series on like, just supporting the family and like, we know what you're going through. Mm. This isn't absurd. This is, this is part of what's going on. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. How can families practice self care or just things that prevent burnout? Um, I think that goes along with some boundaries, definitely saying yes to some things, no to some things and having some practice around that will naturally clear up um, some time for self-care or some mental headspace to not have to think about um, what's going on in the family system or even not having to think about like, okay, is ERP happening all the time? Is this person going to get better? Um, or even the individual maybe participating in some obsession around that is that we need to equally, as, as hard as we're working on getting through this thing, reward ourselves in a non-compulsive way, mm -hmm. reward ourselves for all the hard work we're doing. Like, look at that. I'm so proud of myself that I just said that to you. Like, how did that feel? Was that good? Okay, cool. Like, I think I can do this. Or going out for ice cream or spending some time outside of your home, like not completely problem saturated in what's going on. Because if you choose to stay home, um, stay in the problem, do nothing, that's all you're going to get is, is more of nothing changing, yeah. more of the problem. You, you don't ever get a mental space or a mental break for it. Hmm. So self-care could be, you know, exercise, hiking, like I did yesterday, um, just having a little bit of time, time to yourself, quietness, reading a book, meditation. I mean, you can find all kinds of coping strategies and self-care mm. online. Even just taking a breath before you respond to someone's need for reassurance. Taking a breath before you ask for reassurance if there's time and space for that. Um, so you can see that all of those are boundaries. Like I'm not able to help you because I'm on the way out the door to this thing, right? I'm having dinner with friends. I'll be back in two hours and we can talk about it then. It's not saying I don't have any time to deal with this right now. See you later. Door slams. 
it's a very different message than I hear you and I know that you're struggling, but right now I need to take care of myself and I'm going to be back and, and then I can help you. Mm. There, it's, it's the same thing, but one is with kindness and compassion and also like my, my self care comes first, not in a selfish way, but in order for me to help you, I need to help myself first. It's kind of the, the oxygen mask metaphor. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, as cliche mm-hmm. as it is, it's, uh, yeah, it's they, relevant. Yeah. They tell you on the planes for, for a reason you need oxygen before you can help anyone else. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. So, uh, how can families authentically praise those with OCD and, and maybe kind of explain why I've asked that question, I guess. Yeah. So you will always see in the materials, um, and things and, and writings on OCD of like, you know, praise people, especially your younger kiddos say like, mm-hmm. you're doing a good job, notice and validate these things. Um, and I've even noticed this myself as a therapist is I'm like, good job. And they're just like, why do you have to say that? <laughs> like you always say good job and um, really coming from a place of authenticity of instead of just like slapping on, um, and I'm, I'm guilty of that myself, slapping on something that's like, Hey, you did a really great job here. You get a sticker, um, making it something that is authentic for you and, um, not just saying it just because, right. Maybe some people who are going through their ERP, work are really wanting to hear something specific about what they did. Like, wow, I really saw you struggle through that last part of your exposure and you did it. Like what made you do that? I saw, I saw something change. That was really cool. Like you really pushed through that last piece of anxiety or you really didn't want to touch that contaminated item and you just went for it. Even though you knew that, you know, a level seven anxiety was coming like, being more specific, but genuinely specific. If you saw that change, like don't, don't make it up. If you really didn't think the person did a good job, then find some other way to keep encouraging them. And those encouragers aren't, I think you did a really good job, but if, but is in your sentence, start over again. (laughs) It's like a modifier. That's like, yeah, good job. And next time, try not to do that again. So just delivering like something that feels authentic without knocking somebody down. And that may be on, on both sides. Like, um, you know, thank, thank you wife for praising me on something I did. I feel really good about that. And like the way that you said it made me feel even better about what I'm doing. Mm. Um, or, I didn't like the way that you said that, that really made me think that I was like a little kid or that you patted me on the head. Like, it's okay to share that next time. Could you X, Y, Z? And if they're like, well, I don't really mean that. Like find some way to create that boundary together and accommodate. Yeah. And if there's buts, um, in any kind of validation or, um, credit to someone, go back to the drawing table because mm. it just rips that away right as soon as you said it 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 left that person's okay. heart or soul or brain whatever they were able to hear is it's gone yeah oh however's another one instead of but however how, yes <laughs> that's the one i use <laughs> <laughs> however however yeah or if you do that i mean sometimes that goes back to another boundary. Um, I think you did a good job and I would just want you to experience that right now. If you'd like some feedback, we'll revisit it later Hmm. or I'll think about it and I'll check in with you tomorrow. It's like, I do have feedback for you. And if you want to hear it, I'll give it to you. If you don't, I'm just going to hold on to it. You keep doing your thing. Yeah. Sometimes it's not helpful. 
So if you say you want to hear the feedback, you better mean it that you want to hear the feedback. And if it's a compulsion, then maybe waiting until tomorrow might be helpful. <laughs> yeah. Of just delaying and waiting on that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, did that answer your question? No, it did. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, what, what can a family member... Uh, sorry, what to do when a family member with OCD is asking for reassurance? And you have uh, somewhat addressed this or maybe completely, but if there's anything else, um, yeah. Um, so they're stuck in asking for Yeah, they reassurance. keep asking for reassurance. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's the initial, like, I can't, I can't answer that question. You know, it's not helpful for you. Mm. Um, they continue to ask. You've asked a few times now. I see that you're struggling. Um, would you like some help with this? Or do you want to keep trying to do this on your own? Okay, this is, you know, the third time that you've asked. I'm really, I've offered to help. And I've given you some choices and options on how I can help. But outside of that, I'm still not going to answer that, right? Would you like something else? Would you like a hug? Do you want to do some coping strategies? Do you want to help try and do some re-exposures to get that anxiety up? Like, where are you and what do you want to do? Mm. Um, and then maybe some other things, because sometimes things get really um, intense, and the person needing the reassurance is starting to get even more stressed out. Sometimes they might uh, throw a temper tantrum or become violent or like slam their door or like speed off in their car because they're mad. And like the OCD is just pinging on the back of the brain, like answer this question. They may actually go do another compulsion so that person can encourage them like to work on it. But if it gets to moments like that where things are starting to become escalated, it's not beneficial nor fair for anyone to stay in that situation. Oftentimes I will say, like, it's okay for either one of you to leave and, like, disperse away from that a little bit more. That way the trigger isn't there, the trigger to ask. Even though hours may pass and they may come back and they ask again, but it's like, look, you, you have a choice. I can either help you in the ways that I've stated or in any other ways that you have an idea about. Or I think that I just need to remove myself from the situation. Hmm. And I'm going to be back. And that doesn't mean I don't love you. And it doesn't mean I'm not supporting you. I've given you a choice. And now I'm enacting my own plan around boundaries and self-care. Hmm. That's really hard. Yeah. Because you're leaving someone in pain. Mm. It can help a lot, especially it, it, unless there's like a, you know, a dangerous situation. You can't leave your seven-year-old kid at home and be like, "All right, kid, I'll be back later." Yeah. <laughs> um, but in in cases like that where there are some um, younger kiddos or like safety concerns, because a lot of times teenagers make some some threatening behavior or even adults make some threatening behavior of like, you know, do this or else. And it could be anything like I'm going to, you know, rip this thing up that you need or um, break something or whatever. Like it's okay to, to ask for someone else's help. Mm -hmm. And in turn, that's why I think like family support is so helpful because it's not just for the family. It's allowing the family an outlet of like, hey, we're going to need some other people to help with this if things get worse, we might need a break. We might need aunt to come over. We might need, you know, I might, might want to go visit my sister or you know, a brother or a family just to get a little bit of an escape to help coming back with your bucket full to be able to continue to do that. Hmm. Continue to support, continue to, you know, fight and battle with that person against OCD. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, and similar question is what to do when a family member with OCD is confessing, which is another compulsion? That one's a tough one. Hmm. 
Because you can't like put tape over someone's mouth (laughs) (laughs) or, you know, yelling stop or other things like those aren't going to be helpful. Um, I say sometimes like sticking with the ambiguity is like, I'm not really sure that I heard everything that you said and I'm choosing not to hear and I'm going to walk away. Yeah. Maybe, you know, acting as if that, that wasn't completely confessed. Um, maybe even, you know, as, as tools you learn from your therapist or family therapist of undoing the confession, like kind of confusing it. This is, you know, this is what I heard you say and it's slightly off. Um, or just even, you know, participating and helping that individual get to a point of not confessing as much anyhow. Confessions are hard. They just like, as soon as they come out, the only thing you can do is try to undo them, whether that comes from that individual of undoing and re-exposing mm. or with permission of that family member, another boundary there again, like, do I have permission to challenge you? Cause you just confessed to me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost okay. calling on, you just did a compulsion and do there you want, it is. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you want some help? Yeah. Do you not? Yeah, you're right. Cause that, that, the confessing compulsion could be automatic. They didn't realize they did it. Sometimes they may consciously know they're doing it to get <laughs> rich. Well, just to confess. Uh, but yeah, sometimes it may just be automatic. They're not even aware. They're so stuck in the obsession. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. No, on, the, on that note too, I yeah. think sometimes when um, like a boundary with families, just learning like, Oh, I'm reading this book, you know, um, a family member with OCD and I I read in the book on page 72, you're doing that thing again, that not everything is a compulsion and to kind of check in with that person first, because there is that ability to be like, you're compulsing right now. That's compulsion. That's compulsion. You're doing it again. Like, Mm -hmm. and then that person's getting really frustrated with the process because they're seeing it everywhere when that may or may not be true. And sometimes approaching it is, I, I believe that's a compulsion. Is it or not? Yeah. Okay. Well, you did this 200 times last week, so I think it is now because sometimes the person's like, no, it's not. I just want to feel better. Yeah. Um, or I don't want to tell them because then they won't do it anymore. This is my last thing um, of just being able to, you know, push back on that a little bit and and question like, is it a compulsion or is it not? Well, you know, I'm starting to think like as your partner that it is because I feel like this has been a lot over the last two weeks. Can we talk about that? And if you're not ready now, maybe later, Okay. like it's okay to press the pause button and, and not be ready. But if it's been like three months and you haven't come back to it, then we're participating in some avoidance yeah okay cool yeah i like that and then similar question to those last two but more this time uh what to do for a family member with ocd when you kind of you can see that they're doing compulsions or rituals such as like checking or cleaning or any other that doesn't necessarily involve the family member but you you sort of quote unquote catch them in the act of doing it how to kind of approach that Um, again, approaching it with permission. And if you're not involved in on the therapy, it is that person's choice, whether they do it or not, you know, involve you in on the family portion of that. If they say no, and they refuse, you have every right to um, seek your own therapeutic support and educate yourself. Mm. It is also with permission of that person. So here's where boundaries really come into play. It is not okay And I think family members are just trying to help in any way they can. Let's say someone's in a cleaning compulsion and they've like been cleaning the kitchen for hours or just scrubbing on one little thing and the family's starting to get irritated. You can feel that energy in in the household. Mm. You know, maybe someone's in the kitchen like cooking and they're having to work around this person or like they're in the middle of the floor doing some sort of compulsion that's kind of in the way of the family system in general. Um, you can say, you know, 
I, I see that you're stuck in a compulsion. Do you want some help? Or if not, I do need you to get up and move somewhere else. And then that boundary is going to kind of drive some behavior either way. But what happens, uh, oftentimes families think they're helping without reading and without being educated on what to do. And let's say someone just like is scrubbing and scrubbing, clean the whole kitchen and they're like, oh, I feel better. And then they go in there with a bottle of ketchup and they're like all over the counter. Well, we just made it dirty for you. And maybe it is around cleaning versus contamination. And they think they're helping by like, you can tolerate some dirtiness, mm. but they've actually just, you know, created something else for that person when they weren't ready, when they weren't willing, and when they did not sign up to do the exposure. Yeah. That, I think, is often what leads to some of those tantrums or um, more violent or physical behavior because they're so pissed, mm. which they have every right to be like, yeah. that's not the way as a family member that you're participating in compulsions by poking the bear without permission. No bear wants to be poked, to be honest. But yeah. if you're invited in on participating in exposures or you have a younger kiddo and you're like, look, like I'm here to challenge you because it's, this is getting in the way of everything else that's going on. There are some natural consequences to what happens um, being challenged on compulsions. Mm -hmm. So with younger kiddos, there's more of, you know, like exposure and rewards plans set up, like a behavior contract of this is what we expect. Um, families should be doing the same. Like, how do we challenge you? How can you hear us? And instead of me picking up all the books because you're studying in the middle of the floor and this is the only safe pace, place that you can study, but we need you to be in your room, instead of picking it all up, I'm going to ask you to help me. I'm going to give you a five-minute timer. You know, I'm going to come back in an hour, and that's like the drop-dead date is just setting some of those boundaries of like, I am going to come back. I'm not just going to leave you here to disrupt all of this stuff, but kind of asking for permission to. Mm -hmm. That's complicated. I think as a therapist, I spend quite a bit of time hashing that out so that each party gets to say like, mm, no, that's not going to work. Like that'll really make me mad and I'll just want to do compulsions even more. Or I really will hear that like you don't love me and I'll feel alone. So hashing out like what each party is open to doing um, because all of our um, tolerance level for assertiveness is different. Yeah. I think that's fair to broach that. Hmm. Yeah. No, thank you for that. That was, that was great. Uh, okay. So slight change of pace now. Um, <laughs> advice for living a meaningful life. Mm. And you can you can answer this as either Laurie the therapist or Laurie the human being. Uh, they're both mutually inclusive. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for someone who hasn't done any values work, like a value sort can be helpful. So I already have you know done a lot of that work for myself. I think a constant reevaluation of like, where is my life right now? Mm. Um, ha being a person who struggles with perfectionism myself, I can get on this like really hard driven line of like, here's my path. That's what I'm doing. Mm. But sometimes organically, that's not like where I am or even what I want in that moment. So just kind of, checking in with myself. And I think that I do that by getting away, um, being in nature, being in the mountains, being with my friends, with my family, just like spending time to allow me to naturally reevaluate. I don't have like this date on my calendar, which I'm like, this is reevaluation, reevaluation Wednesday. Mm. Um, it's just more of an organic flow. Like when something feels off, I might not be living in line with my values. That's what I think is a meaningful life. Yeah. Okay, cool. I like it. And then uh, I did ask you this question last time, but I'll ask it again because I can't remember what you said. 
so <laughs> you could either repeat what you said if you can remember or change it. Um, uh, you've got a billboard in Denver. What do you want written on that billboard? I didn't answer this before. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think we ran out of time. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I can't remember. <laughs> I put it on Denver. Um, we don't have an IOP, but there is help. <laughs> we have no treatment uh, facilities around OCD in Denver. Um, so I think that that often uh, gets gives people the the idea that there is nothing here <laughs> yeah yeah good point but there there is, there are a lot of uh icd therapists right uh-huh yeah cool a fair amount yeah yeah uh excellent uh and is there anything else that you wish you could have shared today um i just really appreciate when people want to involve their families or their friends or their coworkers in their treatment. Um, I think as a culture, we often get so wrapped up in doing everything ourselves and being super independent, but there is so much value in community and like being vulnerable. And I know vulnerability is super hard. Like, it's not like you're like, Oh, yay, Brene Brown's work. And here we are. And I know what vulnerability is. And now I'm gonna not do it. Like, yeah. it's really scary. So like the amount of vulnerability that people have in, in showing up and sharing a part of their world to get someone else to support or even know what they're going through. It is so helpful and so healing. And like, for me, it's an honor to see that. Um, and, you know, to try practice that myself too, like mm. it's, I'm just in, in awe by, by people surrounding and supporting and being a part of the community. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which is part of what we're doing with, with the game changers as well. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. well, look, thank you so much for coming on again and also talking about this important topic. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm glad to share. There you have it. Thanks a lot to Laurie for her time and I hope you guys found it useful. And quick disclaimer guys, this podcast is not therapy. It's not a replacement for therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care. Mm -hmm.